um, yeah, for um, Carl and uh, Dr. Gill. So thank you for joining us today uh, to the Data Analytic Colloquium. Uh, let me just, um, uh, I'm Peter, and then uh, we, we have a co-host, um, Carl, uh, Professor Ho from UTD, uh, University of, uh, of, of Texas at Dallas. Uh, let me just briefly uh, introduce the Data Analytic Colloquium um, to you all. Actually, this is an initiative uh, co-sponsored uh, by the National University, Chongqing University from Taiwan, and then uh, and the University of Dallas, uh, in Texas uh, at Dallas. So we initiate this program. Uh, actually, we try to build a community uh, online platform so that uh, we can invite uh, important important uh, scholars uh, in the field uh, so that we can share some uh, the knowledge about uh, methodology and data analytics. So that's why we have um, Professor uh, Jeff Gill today. And so anyone who's interested in the previous uh, presentations, uh, please check on our website uh, and our uh, YouTube channel. Uh, we can, we all had already put on those um, uploaded uh, the videos on the channel. So uh, please um, uh, find your own time and uh, review all those videos. And then you are welcome to give us any feedbacks. And today uh, uh, we're going to uh, formally introduce um, Jeff Gill, Professor Jeff Gill, and then I'm going to turn the microphone to uh, Professor Ho. Carl? Hello, Peter. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And uh, good evening to the um, uh, American uh, uh, participants. And um, uh, allow me to introduce our uh, uh, honorable guest, and um, I know Jeff uh, for quite a while, but uh, he is one of the most influential, most important scholars that I know. And uh, currently, he's uh, um, he's holding the, the distinguished professorship in the Department of Government in the Department of Mathematics and Statistics uh, at the American University. He's also the founding director of the Center for Data Science. And um, at, as I describe him as one of the most influential data science and political science methodology, and um, mostly because of his uh, uh, contribution in the Bayesian models. And his book uh, title, uh, Bayesian Methods, a Social and uh, Behavioral Science Sciences Approach, is already in the third edition. I believe he wrote a book uh, for his classes when he uh, taught in uh, Harvard University and also WashU, Washington University in uh, St. Louis. And um, uh, Dr. Q is also um, prolific, prolific in um, uh, in his works in political science, data science, and statistics. And he has done a lot of work in uh, development of the hierarchical model, Bayesian hier hierarchical models, and uh, non-parametric non Bayesian models elicited uh, prior development from expert interviews and, and also fundamental issues in, in um, statistical inference. I think I will just make it short, and uh, there's actually a long list of his uh, publications and contributions. Uh, today uh, uh, or tonight, he's going to deliver the speech titled Introduction, uh, Critical Differences in Bayesian and Non-Bayesian Inference and Why the Former is Better. Without further ado, allow me to introduce Introduce <clears throat> Professor Jeff Q. Thank you, Carl. That was very kind of you. I appreciate the introduction. And it's nice to virtually be with everybody. Um, yes. You're all little gray dots to me. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I <laughs> wish I was here in person doing this. It's a, lot, <laughs> it's a lot more fun to see the faces and everything. But we'll we'll do fine. Maybe. We'll do fine. Yeah. Um, so uh, Professor Ho already gave the title, so we can move on to some preliminary. Uh, next, next page. Uh, hopefully we'll get this under control. We had a few technical minor issues. Yeah, let me see if that this is the yeah. second page. I yeah. think that, yeah, I think that we skipped a page. Can you go back one? There we go. Um, so it, so it's common in, um, nope, go back. Go back. Yeah, the one with the graphic. So the first page, second page. There's a page. Yeah, there it is. That page four. No, I went, to pay, I went to page number one uh, on the um, in the numbers oh. up top. Now you're running all my drama. Go back. Go back quickly. 
<laughs> that is that is that is the first page. There, oh, that's the cover page. So go to page number one. Mm -hmm. is this, is this there we reading? go. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. So just some standard things to get us started. Um, uh, it's common uh, giving presentations in uh, the medical world to say whether you yeah. financial. I don't have any, unfortunately. Um, the doctors I work with, they'll have five or ten things there. Um, uh, everything here is uh, really based on R or or um, uh, the um, uh, the uh, the Bayesian MCMC world, which has another set of packages I'll talk about. Um, there's not much code in the talk, but whatever there is, it's available at my web page. Um, and everything I'm going to say is fair and balanced. Uh, that uh, a little graphic there. Um, also, um, I know that it's like an unusual format, but if anybody has any questions or anything they want me to stop clarify better, um, tell Dr. Ho somehow, and he'll tell me. Yeah. Is that is that the way you want to do it, Carl? Sure. Or Peter will do that too. We will. We okay. will have a Q and A from students uh, yeah. uh, so, after the presentation. Yeah. We can do it uh, in the chat box or either languages. Okay, excellent, excellent, because um, I don't mind being interrupted or anything like that if I'm not making something as clear as it should be. So let's get started. Um, so on the next slide is something I get asked all the time uh, about Bayesian inference and Bayesian modeling um, on page two. Uh, Do you see that? Yeah. Uh, page two, so what's still on page one. There we go. There's page two. So, okay, what typifies Bayesian models? Um, why are they different? Um, for actually historical reason, Bayesian models, and I'll discuss this in more detail, are much more clear and overt and out front about what the model assumptions are. Um, it's also a way to make probability statements about quantities that you don't know for a fact. Um, I'll talk about that as well. But um, we do know that it's much better to, to talk about unknowns with probabilities rather than things like confidence and whatnot. More on that to come. It's an ability to take a model that you have also and learn, that is to update it when new information comes in, in a very seamless, very rigorous, very clear way. Um, we can also put a qualitative knowledge into the model. And I've done that on occasion where uh, I had qualitative information from elite interviews and things of that nature. And, and I was able to build prior distributions with that and integrate it into a statistical model. Um, as, as many of you know, of course, there's there's a bit of tension between qualitative and quantitative uh, uh, researchers in some of our fields. Um, I think this is a terrific way to reconcile that to a great extent. Um, it's also recognition that things that we study um, are changing over time. Uh, what I mean by that is, um, the hardest thing you can study academically are humans. And so um, I always say I study humans uh, socially, politically, and biomedically. But when you study humans, you're the hard sciences, OK? Um, and engineering, mm -hmm. chemistry, physics, those are easy sciences, relatively speaking. Humans are very difficult to understand, to model, uh, and so on and so forth. But one of the hallmarks of human sourced data is things change. Now, most of the STAT 101 tools from the late 19th, early 20th century of statistics, mostly what they were studying were physical uh, uh, items, like um, the, the speed of light was unknown, and they were measuring it in different ways, and there was a lot of variance, but they knew it was fixed. Very little is fixed, okay, in terms of groups of humans. So the probability that India and Pakistan went to war today is different than it was a week ago. Um, hopefully not fundamentally different, but these things change. The, the, uh, so the Bayesian paradigm gives us a way to admit that change, model that change, and update when new information comes in. You'll see today that um, talking about model quality, model fit, sensitivity to assumptions is very direct and clear. And um, it's free from what's called the null hypothesis significance testing paradigm. OK, this is an awful thing, which I will talk about in about 10 or 15 minutes, that all of the social sciences participate in to a great extent. And you've all learned it. Uh, you've all memorized it for the test. Um, it is actually wrong. And we'll get to that. 
Um, so on the next slide, <laughs> I want to talk about the different kinds of statisticians. All right. Um, so um, can we move on to slide three? Excellent. So, um, so it turns out there are different kinds of statisticians, and that would just absolutely, if I told that to an undergraduate, uh, don't do that, Carl, go back, go back, go back, go back, <laughs> go back, go back quickly, nobody look. Okay, it will be slowly. Um, do you see the, the page three now? Uh, no, I'm seeing page four. It is slow in... Um, so in my screen is still showing page three. There we go. I'm on page three now. OK, yeah. So um, yeah. just to get this discussion started, um, uh, there's a there's an old Simpsons episode from, um, I, I think, the 90s where they were trying to show how boring the space shuttle missions had become. And uh, the line went, uh, this is a really exciting crew that we have for this space mission. We have a mathematician a statistician and a different kind of statistician. <laughs> and so that was literally the dullest group of people that the writers could think of, but they were correct <laughs> in the sense that there are different kinds of statisticians. Um, so uh, it turns out when you go to a conference, when you talk to colleagues and they say, well, I don't know about that Bayesian stuff, I'm a frequentist. Almost nobody is a free, true frequentist in the social sciences, okay? A true frequentist, this comes from Naaman and Pearson uh, mostly, um, that if you are in that environment, you have an unending flow of IID that is independent, identically distributed data coming at you all the time. And you can make very sharp uh, hypothesis tests. You always set alpha in advance. And 0 0.050001 is fundamentally different than 0.499. Okay? And, and they also, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, they also can't can't accept hypotheses in a way that we can't. Okay, Bayesians are very different. Um, Bayesians come from a different tradition, um, more probabilistic perspective, and it's the idea that everything you don't know for a fact, everything you don't know for a fact, is treated with a probability statement. Okay. And there's no other way to do uncertainty. And then we update those probability statements as data comes in. Um, so what, when most people in the social sciences say they're a frequentist, what they really mean is they're a likelihoodist, okay? They get a one-off sample. You know, you, you can only do a survey contextually in time once, okay? Um, they're, 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 they're building statistics usually based on likelihood statements like the one you see here. Uh, Likelihood uh, statements have very good properties. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, they weren't fully laid out until this citation here in 1962. But it turns out that every likelihoodist is a Bayesian. That is, every likelihood model is a Bayesian model with a the appropriate flat uh, prior distribution. And they're exactly the same asymptotically, and I'll show that to you mathematically. So. Uh, likelihoodists are Bayesians that don't know that. And so I like to say everyone's a Bayesian. Some of us know it. So hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll be a Bayesian and you'll know it. Um, so uh, uh, the um, my drama's messed up a little bit, but now we want to look at some differences, some important differences between frequentists and Bayesian because likelihoodists are really Bayesians. So um, uh, the first one's obvious. It's some pictures from a, a recent political science conference. You want to move to slide four? Uh, yeah, there we go. So, I mean, this is this is a, so, such an obvious point, I barely have to make it, um, the visual differences. Uh, uh, again, this is just at a recent political science conference. Um, <laughs> but more, more importantly, why don't we go on to another critical difference? Um, Next page. Yeah, sorry. That's what I meant. Um, so a big difference is what's considered fixed in the in inferential setup. So to a frequentist, data are this IID coming at them all the time, constant sampling. And what they're studying are parameters that are assumed to be fixed by nature. You know, what is the speed of light? Right and and physical things for the most part, but not not strictly. 
Um, do, Bayesians have a different way of thinking about that. Once the data are observed, the data are fixed. They're not a random quantity anymore. And what I mean by that is I get, a, I, get a, I go out and I do a survey, I collect international relations data, I assemble it, I put it in a file, it sits on my hard drive, I go away for vacation. No, actually, I can't do that anymore. Um, I, I, you know, I ignore it for a month and I come back and it's exactly the same. OK, um, so once the data are observed, they're fixed. OK, what's considered non fixed are unknown parameters and they get described with a probability distribution. OK, and the more we know, uh, the narrower that probability distribution is. OK, so next slide. Um, so you this is just a little late. Yeah. Yep. So um, another um, difference is the interpretation of probability. OK, so we all had class or classes where we learned what's a probability, where are the Kolmogorov axioms, uh, what's a conditional probability, what's a joint probability, and then Bayes' law and, and all these things. So I'm not talking about the mathematical things you learned about probability. I'm talking about these people think of probability. So to a frequentist, probability is from a long run of doing things, okay? That's actually literally where the name comes from. You're gonna flip a coin frequently. So if Carl gives me a coin and and I wanna, I wanna understand what the probability of flipping it and get a heads is, and I'm a frequentist, I'm gonna flip it 500 times into a sand pit and just record the number of heads and tails that I get. That's frequentism, okay? So what they care about mm -hmm. is the probability mm -hmm. of the data showing something given a hypothesis, which you see in the second bullet point. So my hypothesis is, well, maybe I don't trust Carl and I'm going to test this coin, right? I think it's, you know, it's not a 50-50 coin or something. Um, by the way, those coins do exist occasionally. Um, and so, um, so if you're a frequentist, you do something frequently and they can do it as frequently as they want because they have this unending supply of data coming at them, okay? Now, to a Bayesian, probability, as you see here, is the common phrase is degree of belief. There's another phrase that gets used all the time, which is, what would you bet with your own money? Okay? So, in other words, um, if you had to bet on something, knowing what you knew at the time, what would you do? How, 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 you know, how much would you bet on, a, on an outcome? Okay? Um, that's a very personal version of probability. OK, and it doesn't matter if people differ as well as you justify uh, your your statements. Um, so what Bayesians are interested in is the probability of an unknown theta, some values, OK, given fixed data, which is that statement you see there in the second bullet. Um, can we go to slide seven? So so these are important just in how we think about um, uh, unknowns and things we'd like to know or like to know more about. There's also differences in the general inference that goes on. So uh, frequentists, they generally work with point estimates, standard errors, confidence intervals. Again, their deduction is done from the probability of the random data given a hypothesis setting alpha in advance. Now, most social scientists don't set alpha in advance. They use a p-value and they, and they see what uh, the, the p-value is realized at, what level. But a frequentist fixes alpha in advance and they're locked into it, okay? Um, so what, what happens then is they accept a, a, a hypothesis, a H1, if the probability of the data given that, the opposite hypothesis is less than alpha and vice versa if it's greater or equal to alpha. Wait a minute, that word accept right there should make you feel very un uncomfortable because at some point, in your educational career, in some statistics course, it was beaten out of you that you cannot accept hy alternate hypotheses, right? You cannot accept the null because there's an infinite number of alternatives to the null, okay? That's not how frequentism is set up. It's set up where there's only two possibilities, and when you reject one, you accept the other. And it's quite interesting to go back to the Neyman and Pearson papers from roughly the 20s, maybe a little earlier, and read the way they their language works. Um, and it, it looks like this. 
Bayesians clearly don't do that. Um, again, induction is from some probability uh, of some unknown given the data. That's called a posterior distribution, starting with P of theta, which is not conditional on the data that's coming in. It's conditional on prior knowledge. That's called a prior distribution. Bayesians tend not to do as much um, a point giving point estimates so much as showing distributions in, in that process. Um, we also have uh, our version of a confidence interval, except they're much better, as you'll see in this talk. So um, in the next uh, slide eight, um, I want to make a point, uh, another, a fair and balanced point. Uh, actually, I think I have one more difference, and then I have a fair and balanced point. Um, quality checks. So what do you do after you've run the model, you've estimated what you want to estimate, so on and so forth. Frequent tests generally uh, calculate both type one and type two errors. Um, even if they're sort of quasi-frequent tests and they're fuzzy about setting alpha in advance, sometimes um, there's a discussion of effect size or power, which is one minus the probability of a type two error. Usually there's fixation with small differences in p-values, um, which, is, which is wildly misguided um, I'm editor in chief of political analysis, and um, we banned people on experimental data unless they're unless they're uh, intellectually justified, which is hard to do. Um, and so you'll you very rarely see p values, and you'll never see stars in 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 political analysis because they're stupid. Um, what Bayesians do is things like posterior predictive checks. So uh, we will integrate over. Uh, the estimated parameters, and that allows us to generate uh, data that would have come from the model, and then we compare it to the data at hand. And if and if those don't reconcile, if they don't look very very similar, we get uh, uh, suspicious about the model. Um, Bayesians tend to do uh, checks on the prior forms, right? Both because readers and reviewers want it, but also we want to know how sensitive the data are to priors versus okay. Uh, we do have formal processes, which I'll show you one today called a base factor. Um, and there's some other ones, the BIC and the DIC, which are like the Akeki information criteria and the AIC, which you've probably seen. So in the next slide, I have a more philosophical point, uh, Carl, if I could go to slide nine. Um, so I want to first give reasons not to use Bayesian inference in the social sciences. And again, uh, everything I say is fair and balanced. OK, and so if this is you, then you can go get a coffee and not worry about the stock. Um, the population parameters of interest to you are truly fixed and they're unchanging under all circumstances. You have no prior information before you specified the model. It's it's important to pretend that the data come from an, a controlled experiment. You care more about significance than the effect size that you find. Your computers are slow and relatively unavailable, and you want automated cookbook type procedures. So if that fits you, power to you, life is easy. Um, you don't need to worry about this talk. Now, on the other hand, Carl, if we could go to slide 10. Um, and again, these graphics are totally fair and balanced. Um, reason to use Bayesian inference in the social sciences. One, you want to be very careful about some of them in print. You view the world probabilistically rather than as a set of things that are fixed. Um, you recognize that ever, every statistical model ever created and or will be created is subjective. That is, it's subjective what data you got. It's subjective how you handled it. It's subjective what software you use. It's subjective what model you picked. It's subjective how you tested the model. It's subjective how you discussed the model. It's subjective how you build a regression table or whatever. All of those are subjective decisions. There will never ever be an objective statistical model. Also, you recognize that prior information abounds in the social sciences, okay? And it really does. Um, in fact, in most social sciences, it's not that we lack prior information, it's that we have so much prior information, it's a job to sort through it, okay? So relative to that, I don't wanna ever read or look at a statistical model for someone that had no prior information before they started running regressions, right? Um, and um, they're not willing to be careful about the assumptions. Uh, so go on to the next slide. 
The word subjectivity, by the way, is sensitive to Bayesians because uh, when we were under assault by um, frequentists in the early mid 20th century, um, uh, one of the things they said is, well, you're subjective because you put prior distributions on things and you get to choose that. And we're objective because we don't do that. And that's just it was just words. It, it's a, it was a terrible argument. So I'm going to talk for a few minutes about some traditional problems um, in the way we do non-Bayesian statistics in the social sciences. And by that, I mean like three quarters of, of quantitative social scientists have at least some of these sins. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about small or large inference, uh, uh, sample size, confidence, uh, some assumption issues, and then I'll get to the null hypothesis testing issue. Um, this is a, a drawing, by the way, of a recent political science conference. Um, I think that was a political theory panel, though. So, OK, so let's move on to slide 12. And again, anytime you want to make a point, ask a question, interrupt, uh, uh, tell uh, one of the professors and they'll they'll tell me to stop. Um, so there's a thing that pervades uh, the social sciences, and it's I would say it's more in sociology and political science than uh, economics or poly um, or psychology. It's the idea that you're doing better work because you have bigger data sets and can put more stars on the regression table. OK, and and, and that's not true. OK, first of all, three stars does not mean the null is less likely than one or two stars because you had to assume the null was true to get stars. Right. So they all assume the null. Um, and so it, stars just mislead people. Most people don't understand p-values. But the idea that you, use it, you when you have big data, you're doing better work is fundamentally wrong. So I'm going to contrast two um, projects. The one on the left is called SETI. Does anybody know what SETI is? Usually somebody, one or two people, um, and I can't tell because I can't see raised hands or anything. It's search for extra, extraterrestrial intelligence, okay? So this is a really cool project, and of course it's out of Berkeley. Um, and it's the idea that radio signals are, are arriving on the Earth all the time in gigantic numbers, okay, from space. And uh, most, uh, so far, all of them are purely random in the sense that they're generated by celestial objects without communication intent. And so what the SETI group does is they study these things and they take billions of radio signals and they build this fuzzy looking distribution that you see here. And it's made up of billions and billions of actual data points, okay? And so what that means is, notice the vertical lines that start and end that distribution. If you get a value that's epsilon to the right or to the left of that distribution, it's interesting, okay? And it might be a, um, a communication from extraterrestrial intelligence, either uh, just beaming stuff out or beaming it directly at us. The cool part of this project is anybody who wants can go to that, download a software package for PC or Mac, and what happens is when you're not using your computer, which by the way is most of the time, uh, SETI is, is, is sending these samples to your computer and your computer is grinding through them looking for something anomalous, something weird, okay? And the really cool part is when, if it finds something like that, it sends that distribution back to SETI with a data point that's anomalous. And if it turns out that that is actually, a, you get credit for discovering alien intelligence, not SETI. They, they won't take credit for it. They'll say, Dr. Carl Ho found a communication from aliens to us, and, and, and you'll be famous. Um, so, so that's a project with huge, huge data. Um, I want to contrast that with something on the right, which is Italian marriage rates, okay, um, for 15 years. You see the dates. This is a project I did. And as you know, it's really hard to get good statistical inferences when your N is 15, right? Um, I was able to do that. Uh, these are actually um, these are uh, summaries because they're they're rates, right? So um, so they have error bars on those rates. Um, and what you what I was able to do is make some statements with only 15 data points because I talked about Italian marriage rates in distributional terms. Okay, so the first thing you notice is there's there's a noticeable dip 
in Italian, the propensity for Italians to marry in the early 1940s. Well, it turns out there was this big fracas, this big, you know, uh, conflicty thing in Europe at the time. It was in all the newspapers. You've probably heard about it. Um, and so uh, while the Italians were away uh, fighting, um, marriage rates went down. But you see in the early early part of, of the of the time series there, um, the marriage rates are pretty healthy. They do the dip. And then right after the war ends, the Italian soldiers come home and it goes way up because they're marrying their sweethearts that they left behind. And then it dips back down to pretty much the rate it was before the war. And so um, you can say things like that because it's distri- I'm talking about it distributionally. Now, you wouldn't want to take a data set with 15 data points and then put in a dummy variable war because degrees of freedom to 14 plus whatever statistical tool uh, it, what it is imposing so by being bayesian and talking about it in distributional terms i was able to take 15 data points and and, and make it uh, you know something interesting as opposed to 15 or billions and billions of data points does it mean that that searching for aliens is more important or less important than un- analyzing a sociological data set no it doesn't it might it depends on your view but the point is, I'm not doing worse work than SETI is looking for aliens. Um, can we move, move to slide 13? Okay, and so um, confidence. So first of all, confidence is the most frequentist thing ever, or ever will be, okay? So here's here's a quiz I would do if we were um, all in the same room. Uh, I think it's hard in this format. Uh, we could vote, right, Carl? Yes, and uh, we can lift a hand. Do you see a hand lifting like this? Raise a hand, and uh, you yeah. can, uh, yeah, virtually lift, lift a hand. Okay, okay. So yeah. let's vote on this. So, um, what which is the correct um, interpretation of a confidence interval? It's an interval that one minus alpha percent chance of containing true value of the parameter, or an interval that over one minus alpha of replications contains the true value of the parameter on average. So let's call the first one A and the second one B. So let's go ahead and vote. <coughs> vote for A. Or B. Or B. And it's anonymous, so you don't you can be you can be candid. You're not <laughs> nobody's gonna call you out. We so one hand at eight. Uh a is and A, right? Is a, a one hand and A. Let's, let's do the B. Let's do the B. Three hands and <laughs> it's hard to be anonymous that everyone see. Uh, oh, well, you're anonymous to me. Um, I yeah. what I usually do in, in a classroom is I say everybody has to vote. It's like voting was in the Soviet Union. It's it's compulsory, right? Um, <laughs> Malaysia too. <laughs> well, it's it turns out it's B, okay. Yeah. And there's a funny thing about the way this is worded is um, people want it to be A. You want it to be A. That feels more comfortable, but it's not. And the reason is this is a frequentist concept. So go to the graph at the right, and that's in every single Stat 101 book, of course. And underneath that graph in the book, it will say. If I replicated this experiment 19 times, 19 more times, okay, uh, for alpha 0.05, I will cover the true theta with my confidence interval 19 times out of 20, right? That's a restatement of B um, in the way many textbooks do. So wait a minute, think about it. That's a frequentist, that's a really frequentist idea that you, I'm going to go back and I'm going to go get a new data set 19 more times run the exact same experiment or whatever the setup is, and then I'll know that I'm covering it 19 times out of the 20, right? The red bar is the one that doesn't, obviously. Now, almost no social scientist can do that, okay? Um, You know, in in psychology and some behavioral science, you can do that. But I can't go back in time and get the American National Election Study for the year 2012. I can't run that study 19 more times. Even if I had infinite money, I can't do that because I can't use my infinite money to build a time machine, right? So this is confidence is the most frequentist idea ever. And um, I said earlier that um, I don't think that there are uh, fixed constants when you're studying humans. 
but I, I wasn't entirely accurate because I, I discovered one about 10 years ago, okay? So my experience in teaching undergraduate statistics, and I've done every flavor of that you can imagine, from engineers all the way to um, uh, 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 humanists, um, that about half the people on the midterm will get this question wrong, the interpretation, these two uh, uh, open arrows that you see. And so I thought, well, I, I don't understand why it's always about 50-50. Let me try and understand that. And so, um, uh, so I did an experiment. I was teaching uh, political science undergrad stats at WashU in St. Louis. And I spent two weeks on the confidence interval. That's four lectures. That's six hours on nothing but the confidence interval. Okay. So I did the theory. Um, I did simulations in R. I did example after example. Um, I did other creative things. Finally, at the end of the two weeks, I said, just memorize this sentence and you'll get it right. So the exam comes a week or two later. Guess what the proportion was? Anybody? Dr. 50%. Yep, it was 50-50. So either I'm a really crummy teacher. Yeah, and that's one of the students already. Yeah. Watch you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and exactly. And so um, so I think it's just a, a fixed thing of people studying statistics uh, for the first time. Um, I would like to see data on that from the AP exam. That would be really interesting. But um, <laughs> but anyway, so, I, so I said we hate you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So what the way people treat confidence in the social sciences, it's kind of this sleight of hand, right, where we, we give a confidence interval and we don't really dive into what it really means. OK, um, can we go to the next slide? No questions. Well, let me interrupt here, uh, uh, Jeff. Sure, please. Now, this is basically, the concept about um, uh, replication and, and uh, bootstrapping and uh, uh, the Stanford School, uh, this Rennie and Hasty to talk about the status quo learning. They, they, you're basically uh, uh, um, changing the way of our machine learning thinking too, because if you want to introduce the Bayesian and uh, not just uh, not just uh, uh, to use the bootstrapping, but you move forward to apply the prior information to for all yeah. kinds of prediction. Yes. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, yeah. So a, a huge fraction of machine learning is, is mm -hmm. basically Bayesian tools that have been repackaged. Um, yes. Uh, yeah. It, it, yeah. I, I mean, it, which is a good thing. Um, mm -hmm. uh, bootstrapping is really interesting because it's useful to everybody, but it's a classic free uh -huh. tool, right? Mm -hmm. So in other words, if I have a, a sample of 500 cases and I'm going to redraw that with replacement 100 mm -hmm. times with a sample of 50, I control all of those levels. That's a very frequentist orientation, right? Uh -huh. um, yes. It just turns out it's useful to everybody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so if you're not familiar with bootstrapping, um, Hastings to Bishrani is the original book yeah. and paper yeah. that mm -hmm. Dr. Ho mentioned, um, but yeah. you'll find it in many texts, and it, it's tremendously useful to know. Um, mm -hmm. uh, okay, so let's move on to buried assumptions. So um, uh, there's, there's a models that people use all the time where there are assumptions dug underneath it that don't often get evaluated when the tool gets used, okay? Now, I mentioned that all likelihood is models are uh, Bayesian models with the, uniform, the appropriate uniform flat prior. But if you're putting a likelihood uh, model into a paper and sending it off for review, you don't, have to, you don't have to justify your flat prior. But you should, in my view. Um, there are loads and loads of models with normality built in that doesn't get justified, you're right? So a uh, classic would be analysis of variance. Right. By the way, which which is misnamed, it should be analysis of variance of means, right? which is really what you're comparing. But there's loads and loads of models that assume normality without telling you that that was evaluated by the author. OK, um, my favorite one of these uh, mistakes is the correlation coefficient or more technically the Pearson product moment correlation coefficient. And that's the one we all use all the time. So several things about that. First of all, it is a linear regression model. I'm not saying it's similar. I'm saying it is. So if you take the correlation coefficient and you multiply it by the standard deviation of y over the standard deviation of x 
in a bivariate analysis, it, it's the slope of the regression between the two. It's um, so. It, 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 but how many times have you seen someone justify a linear and then give you the correlation? Like almost never, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's really easy to see, right? So suppose you had U-shaped data and you um, put a correlation on it, you get a correlation near zero. Now, does that mean U-shaped data don't have a relationship? Oh, no. U-shaped data are really important, particularly in like uh, e economics, econometrics, whatever. Um, so the other thing about a correlation coefficient, and, and this baffles me, is it's a, it's a statistic, right? A statistic. Uh, that means you should be giving it standard error whenever you, okay? And it's, look it up, it's standard error mm -hmm. is ridiculously simple to calculate, okay? Um, and um, like, I have colleagues, they'll come to me and they'll say, hey, I got this correlation of 0.4, is that good? And my answer is always, <laughs> I have no idea. I can't tell you if it's good or bad. You could have you could have a confidence interval around it that went from 0.1 to 0.9, but if, unless you give me a standard error, I have no way of telling you the quality of that. If you get a correlation of 0.9, people would jump up and now be super happy about that. But what if the confidence interval went from 0.99 to 0.1 or 0 0.01, right? You know, therefore your your your, your 0.95 or 0.9 um, correlation coefficient is meaningless, right? So that's just shocking. Uh, I need to be more uh, diligent and 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 uh, make sure none of those get into political analysis without a standard error. Um, uh, there's another thing we do in the social sciences, and this applies to everybody. Um, like, here's the standard, I'll just put it in the context of political science for the moment. Here's a standard empirical political science article. Here are the, here are the, here are the, the topics. Number one, um, such and such is an important and not very well understood problem. Number two, I have a theory that, you know, in, you know, uh, uh, modeling it or thinking about it this way will, will help us understand it better. Number three, I have a data set. Here, here it is. Number four, I ran a model. Number five, regression table. Number six, conclusion, right? Isn't that basically every AJPS article? That is a theory, <laughs> right? Do you really think that that author, those authors, ran a model and they said, "Great, looks wonderful, let's go," right? So we pretend that we don't do what are called specification search, uh, which is ridiculous. Okay, now I'm not saying that um, the average social scientist is a model, right? Um, an a theoretical. But we try different strategies. So, so I'll give you an example. The American National Election Study has, I think, you know, somewhere between five and ten different measures of political ideology of the respondents. You know, the last time I, I looked, it could be more, it could be less than the last one. And so I'm building a model on on voting. Which which one of those do I want? Well, I want the one that fits best, right? So I have a I have a theory. In fact, it's almost a law. Right, um, that I need ideology in a voting model, um, and and so I'm basing it on theory. I'm not being a theoretical, but I need the one. Maybe the seven point scale fits better than the five point scale, or maybe a dichotomous measure for what I'm studying works out better, or something like that. So I'm probably going to try most of them. Right, um, maybe not the dichotomous in that case, but I'm not allowed to say that. Right. So um, there's an economist at UCLA named Ed Lemer, and he complained about this in the 80s, and very few people listen. But he's got some great articles and a great book. One of my favorite um, titles of an article, he's an economist, was Let's Take the Con Out of Econometrics. It, it's definitely worth a read. <laughs> but, so he has a notion about uh, the social sciences, how you would model. Um, so he has these two terms. You have under the horizon variables and over the horizon variables. So under the horizon variables, those are the variables that the literature says you have to have. So in the case of a voting model, you have to have race, gender, education, age, ideology, party ID, and few I'm not thinking about, right? So, so if I send a, a, a submission into a journal and I don't have those, or I don't give a, a real strong justification for dropping one or two, whatever, um, then reviewers are going to drive to my house and beat me up, right? I mean, <laughs> don't get published. 
Um, on the other hand, if that's all you had in your model, you're not contributing to science. We don't learn anything new. So you need to, in addition to those under the horizon variables, you need to have some over the horizon variables. That is something new that you think affects voting behavior. So, so, so my, I could have my under the horizon variables like age, education, uh, gender, uh, ideology, and then my over the horizon variables is going to be something like shoe size. Okay, nobody's ever studied shoe size and voting. All right. Um, so, if I'm able to demonstrate that shoe size matters, I'm doing it in the on the on the basis of control variables. But maybe before I tried shoe size, maybe I I I, I was thinking more about the length of thumbs. Okay. And maybe the length of thumbs affects uh, uh, voting behavior, right? And thumbs didn't work out, but shoe size did. And so I'm really happy and off it. You could imagine what would happen in that case. But my point is, you're trying these over the horizon variables based on your new theory or your new ideas. Um, so what I want to do someday is I want to take an article. And when you, when you get senior enough, you know an article is going to get published somewhere that you wrote. You just have a sense of it. And add one sentence to it, which says, I flailed around all weekend, and this is the best model. And then I want to send it to a journal, and I, I just want to see what the reviewers will say. I'm just curious about that. It'll be funny. And then I'll rip out that sentence, and I'll send it to a different journal and get it published. Um, but it would be a cool experiment. Unfortunately, I'll have to do it myself because no, no co-author would ever be willing to do the experiment with me. <laughs> um, and and there, there's also a downside. What if it got published with that sentence? <laughs> no, <laughs> you, you could take you could take it out in the in the post acceptance editing process. Anyways, um, that's a slight digression just for amusement. But let's go on to slide fifteen. Um, uh, okay, so the the null hypothesis significance test is wrong. There's a vast vast literature on this starting in 1962. Um, at the time. There was an editor in a psychology journal that said, we're a much better psychology journal than we used to be. So we're only accepting results at the 0.01 level, not 0.05. And then the psychometricians and psychologists uh, started writing about that. And the literature, there are thousands of articles on this. I'm only going to talk, and this is a list of problems with it. I'm only going to talk about one because it only takes one to kill it. Okay. So I'm going to talk about um, number five. Can we move on to the next slide? Slide 16. But I'll take any questions on the other one. Um, okay. So the null hypothesis significance test, the way it was told to you, is based upon what's called probabilistic modus tollens. And modus tollens is um, Latin for affirming the consequent. OK, um, this is not what you're seeing. It's not probabilistic modus tollens. It's regular modus tollens. OK, so mm -hmm. if A, then B. OK, not B is observed, therefore not A. All right. Um, so the hypothesis testing version of that would be something like, if A is true, the data will follow an expected pattern, right? The data do not follow this expected pattern, therefore the null is false. Everything on this page is true. And if you walked over, when we could do this, to your um, philosophy department and you talked to one of the logical philosophers, they would tell you modus tollens is correct, okay? But what the null hypothesis significance test, if we get to the next slide, is based on is as I said, probabilistic modus tollens. Now that looks like this, okay? If A, <laughs> then B is highly likely. Not B is observed, therefore A is highly unlikely, okay? Um, so it adds this probabilistic element. The, the hypothesis testing version is, if the null is true, the data are highly likely to follow an expected pattern. Wait, the data do not follow an expected pattern, therefore the null is highly unlikely. Now, looking at that slide, uh, it seems totally benign. But what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to just um, I'm going to just change the right hand side and leave the left hand side the same. If we could have the next slide. Okay. So, if a person is an American, then it is highly unlikely she is a member of Congress. Wait, the person is a member of Congress, therefore it is highly unlikely she's an American. Now, I didn't change the logic at all. I just gave you an example. So the deal is that null hypothesis significance test is logically flawed, okay? It is not, it's not just not optimal, you could do a little better. It's just wrong, okay? Um, what happened was in the early part of uh, the, the evolution of statistics, you had Naaman and Pearson on one side 
uh, and Fisher on the other, right? And so they were frequentists and he's a likelihoodist and they hated each other. They said really yeah. nasty things about each other in print. You can look it up. Um, uh, if you were a student of Naaman and Pearson, you weren't even allowed to talk to Fisher and vice versa, okay? Or they would kick you out of their relative programs. Fisher was politically connected in England where they all lived and worked. He actually got Jersey Naaman kicked out of the country. Uh, Jersey Naaman was a um, native Pole who uh, moved to England, you know, th at the turn of the century, roughly. Um, and so, like, literally, he hated him so much he got him evicted from the country. Um, he did okay. He moved to Berkeley and founded their stat department. Um, but um, so what happened was in the 1940s, roughly, late 30s, 40s, um, textbook writers in the social sciences were afraid to offend either camp because they're both powerful and active still. And so they sort of wrote the hypothesis test in their books, mostly sociologists actually, in such a way that it blended the features of, of the different hypothesis tests. And, and it built in this logical inconsistency, okay? I'm gonna give you an example of how much it matters. Um, what it's really all about is, is the conditional order of the conditional probability. Can we go to the next slide, Carl? Oops. That's so, not the 19. There you go, that's the one, 20. Okay. Um, so here's the thing. Um, uh, people want it to be, and they think it is, uh, and they're wrong. They think the hypothesis test is the probability of the null given the data. So if I, the, the, the wrong answer, the wrong conception, is that if you have a p-value of 0.02, there's only a 2% probability the null is true. Large amounts of people believe that misconception. What it really is, it's the probability of the data given a hypothesis, okay? And when I say the data, I mean a test statistic from the data. Remember, you were taught this, right? You, 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 you got your data, you built a test statistic, you found the critical value, right? And, and based on the null being true, Right. Everybody in the room or rooms did, did that. Um, that's the, that's fine. But you have to remind yourself that it's the probability of the data given the null is true. OK. And these are you know, they're not the same thing. And, and you can only relate them by Bayes law down here. I'm not talking about Bayesian statistics. I'm just talking about basic probability. The problem is you um, almost never have the, the unconditional probability of the null. Um, the probability of the data is a weird thing to think about. If you're a Bayesian or semi-Bayesian even, the probability that, uh, that the data is true, the data is one, right? The probability that the data exists, given the data exists, is one, right? So you don't, you don't, you don't really have a handle on these things, so you can't relate these things directly. So I'm going to give you a true example of how much it could matter on the next slide, Carl. Um, so, um, in the early era of the AIDS pandemic, the Australian government, the health ministry, wanted to have a cheap chemical test for testing for AIDS. And this is even before we knew about HIV. So, um, they, they suspected that the probability of AIDS in the risk group was 2%. The probability of correct classification, that is, the probability of classifying the person as AIDS, given they have AIDS, was 0.95. So this is a cheap chemical test, like those home pregnancy test kits you get at the drugstore, right? And the probability of a correct negative classification was 0.97. That is the probability of C's complement given A's complement is 0.97. Um, and, and so um, the first one is called sensitivity and the second one is called specificity in the epidemiological context. Except, you know, the one, the only good thing about the pandemic, it's, it's, it's made everybody an amateur epidemiologist, right? Just by reading mm -hmm. the newspapers. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so ne next slide, Carl, which is really this sure. slide. So suppose I want a different quantity. I want to reverse the, um, the order of conditionality. You can go ahead and hit the next slide. That is, I want P of A given C instead of P of C given A. Mm -hmm. So if, if you look at this, um, I have P. I have P of A. I have P of C given A from above, but I don't have P of C. Um, I'm just going to use what you see here as the law of of, of total probability, right? And mm -hmm. do a little bit of man manipulation. I'm not going to go through the details. That is, mm -hmm. you know, the only way you can have P of C is P of C and A 
C and A's complement. There's no other thing that can happen. Uh, next slide, Carl. So that allows me to do the calculation. And it turns out that the probability of having A's, given you're classified by the test as having A's, is only about 40%, 0.38. Wow, that's a fundamentally different than what your number than what you're seeing above. It turns out um, the Australian government was not unhappy about that, okay? That is because, usually I have a, a longer discussion here, um, that is, um, you want the numbers you're seeing above to be as high as possible, and it's a trade-off. So you're gonna you're gonna live with a lower P of A given C. So what happens? Um, so uh, so the probability that you actually have AIDS, given you're classified, is forty roughly forty percent. That means sixty percent who are classified as having AIDS don't have it. So what happens to those people? They go to their doctor in and get the gold standard test not the cheap chemical test okay and then they find out they don't have aids okay um and so uh, that's good because you want the numbers high above to, to stop the disease from spreading right when people know they have it they'll stop spreading it presumably um and all you did down below is you ruined someone's life for two weeks before they got in to see their doctor and got the test results right you made the 60 percent miserable but you made the disease um, spread less. So these numbers are actually, up until about five years ago, they were very close to the numbers for the home pregnancy test kits, okay? Because you want women to know as soon as possible that they're pregnant, so they stop smoking and drinking and skydiving or whatever, right? <laughs> uh, so, um, so that's how fundamentally different those conditional probabilities should be. Um, Carl, can we move to the next? Um, so now that I've bashed a lot of other things, let's talk about Bayesian stuff. Um, so the history, um, uh, the, the Reverend Thomas Bayes, he was a cleric in England. Uh, as you see here, he died in 1761. His famous paper, A Doctrine of Chances, was published uh, in 1763, courtesy of his friend Richard Price. Um, that's actually a picture I took of his crypt in central London. Um, it's his family crypt. So he and his family sure. are in there. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I have a picture on my webpage somewhere of me standing in front of it. Um, it's a little <laughs> park in the middle of central London near the city of London, the financial center. And the local office people use this cemetery to eat lunch on the benches um, when the <laughs> weather's good. It, when I say when the weather's good, I mean about, you know, 15 days a year in London. But um, that's almost a joke. Um, so it turns out Laplace had similar ideas. He was French, but at the time, as you may know, English and the Continentals weren't talking too well academically. And then along come these giants of um, frequentist statistics, as you see here. Um, uh, well, we talked about Fisher and Pearson. Uh, there's actually two Pearsons. Carl Fisher was the father. Egon was the one that worked with Jersey Neyman. Uh, Carl Fisher was born C-A-R-L. But he yeah. changed it to K-A-R-L because yeah. he was an admirer of Karl Marx. And Professor Ho may may have done that too. Um, <laughs> yes, because uh, even though I came from the British Hong Kong, <laughs> but I thought <laughs> yeah. I admire. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and um, well, that's why the German, journal Biometrica. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so Karl Marx founded the journal Biometrica, which is a stat journal, and it's got a K instead of a C because of that too. Anyways, um, and they all really hated Bayesian inference, okay? Uh, they despised it, in fact. And so um, uh, so along came the Bayesians of the time, or slightly later, the, these folks, um, who kept the flame alive in a very difficult era because the first group was very powerful. And it led to a world divided. So um, for quite some time, if you got your PhD from a Bayesian department, um, a non-Bayesian, a frequentist department wouldn't even interview you and vice versa. Um, so stat departments got identified as being Bayesian or frequentist, um, which seems bizarre today. Um, uh, the, the one the one major critique that the frequentists had, had which valid, which was uh, for a long time, Bayesians could stipulate their regression model, you know, some complicated regression model, you know, a, a, a multi-level specification with interactions or whatever. And it was possible to get a posterior where you couldn't marginalize, you couldn't integrate out the, the, the parameters to get a regression table. It was impossible or very, very hard. And, and so um, uh, what happened 
was um, uh, a long paper, this guy, in 1990, and it said, hey, there's this idea in statistical physics that we haven't been aware of, we haven't read, that solves that Bayesian problem, okay? And it's called Markov Chain Monte Carlo. Can we have the next slide? Um, and so today, um, I, I, you know, things that have changed my life, you know, gene sequencing, iPhones, online banking, and Gib sampling. Gib sampling <laughs> is a variant of, of Markov Chain Monte Carlo. Um, there's an actual Gib sampler caught in the wild. Can we go on to the next slide? I'm a little behind. So um, actually, Carl, can you make it so everything shows and I'll just remove my drama? Yeah. Oops, go back. Um, so principle number one, um, e explicit direct use of probability statements for anything you don't know, all uncertainty. That is probability models, a likelihood function for the data given the parameters. Yes, we still use the likelihood function. And then probability distributions for parameters. That is probably the density functions, probability mass functions. Um, and then inference is done with inverse probability using Bayes' theorem. And then we provide a full description of the posterior. So those are two principles. Let me describe the steps in the next slide. Uh, let's remove the drama, um, it, Carl, if you don't mind. Um, so no. Number one, specify a model for the unknown parameter values, the things you want to understand, that includes some prior knowledge about the parameters. If, um, if you don't have much, we, uh, I'll talk about do, diffuse priors in a little bit. Update that knowledge about unknown, the unknown parameters by conditioning the probability model on the observed data that comes in. And then evaluate the fit of that, okay? And, and check the sensitivity of, the, of your assumptions. So those are the mechanical steps. The next slide, Carl, is, is the mathematical version of that. Mm -hmm. So um, the posterior of the unknown theta, given the data x, which is bold because it's multidimensional typically, is equal to mm -hmm. the prior distribution on theta times the likelihood for theta given x divided by the integral of that so that um, the uh, the posterior on the left hand side uh, integrates or sums to one. So you can see that's Bayes' law right there. Um, mm -hmm. And so, what almost all of the time that denominator is just an inconvenience, and we can get uh, we can get its value later on with proportionality. Okay, so it's it's just to make sure that the left hand side sums or integrates to one. It, we, there's a couple other uses for it, but they're minor by comparison. So what I can do all, all my Bayesian without it using proportionality, which is what that squiggly thing looks like, okay? Um, mm. And um, if I found at the end of the day that my posterior integrates or sums to 1.4, I'll just divide everything by 1.4, right? So why carry these complex calculations if I don't have to? So that integral is typically not necessary. So the posterior probability is proportional to the prior probability times the likelihood. And it's always a balance between those two things, as I'm going to show you. Can we go on to the next slide? Um, why don't you remove the drama for me? Um, so mm -hmm. before we go to an example, um, just some different types of priors. I get this question a lot. I'm going to do this fairly quickly based on our, our time constraints. Um, mm -hmm. Empirical Bayes was out of fashion for a long time, especially among Bayesians, which is odd. It's the idea, take some, take some par part of the data, uh, pull it back, and calculate a prior from that, and then use that prior on the rest of the data. And Bayesians didn't like that, but that's now very, very stylish in statistics because that describes a large fraction of machine learning. Um, proper Bayes, um, that means that um, you use things like your research or intuition, knowledge from substantive uh, experts, what the literature says that that distribution looked like, um, uh, you know, uh, in other words, knowledge, right? Um, reference Bayes, and sometimes these people are called objective Bayesians. That's, uh, I'm, I'm going to, this is roughly a description, build a, a, a prior that moves as little, and this literature gets very, very mathematical. Um, if you have a loss function, um, you can do risk, obviously, and there's a very nice setup for decision theoretic Bayes, but you have to have a loss function, okay? 
And so mm-hmm. that works extraordinarily well in economics and not so well in the rest of the social sciences. I don't know what the loss function is if I if I do a voting model that that's wrong. Um, but, you know, there is one. Um, actually, Gary King says uh, there there's actually um, ne- it goes the other way because you'll get cited more. <laughs> <laughs> But that's that's more of irony than than a, than a good objective. <laughs> Having said that, most social science Bayesians are what I call my term for are Bayesians of convenience. That is, they put diffuse priors on everything, um, and and they want the they they want the 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 logic of of Bayesian inference that is using probability uh, for all uncertainty, and then the powerful engine of MCMC. Um, uh, so, uh, can we go to the next slide? Um, uh, okay, uh, just for time, uh, I'm going to skip this one. Um, and I'm going to skip this one. This this looks like a, a an 18th century painting of St. John the Baptist by the Dutch painter uh, uh, Green, Greenberg, but it's really Kevin Quinn or somebody like that preaching the Bayesian um, gospel, but then mm. using... Uh, or, you know, diffuse prior. So let's go on. That That's in there for slight humor value. Um, so uh, let's do an example. So th- this is the simplest example I can think of. Um, so we have um, X1 through Xn, which are 0, 1 mm-hmm. um, dichotomous observations, uh, Bernoulli. Uh, so mm-hmm. what our interest in is estimating P, which is the probability of a head, so the probability of a 1, whatever y- mm-hmm. your setup is. Um, I want to estimate that, so I need a prior. I'm going to put a beta distribution prior on it. Beta distributions are very handy for this purpose because they're bounded by zero and one, so I don't have to do truncation mathematically. Um, Mm. They're very flexible in terms of you stick in values of A and B. They can be unimodal and symmetric. They can be skewed one way or the other. They can even be bimodal. So it's a it's it's a neat it's a neat uh, and simple assumption for um, putting a prior on an unknown probability. The first thing I'm going to do is a trick, which is if if all I if all I want to do is understand um, uh, what P looks like, I don't need the order of the X's. Right. I just need their sum. Right. I don't care if there were two heads in a row that started the series. Um, And I know that when you sum those Bernoulli's, it's a binomial distribution. So Mm -hmm. I'm going to take all those X's and Mm -hmm. I'm going to create one random variable, which is Y, which is Mm -hmm. distributed binomial N P. Can we hit the next Mm -hmm. button? Mm-hmm. So give, given that setup, okay, um, now all I have to do is specify the PDFs and PMFs, um, which should be coming at you. Mm-hmm. Oops, sorry. Oh, it's don't worry about it. Okay. It's, mm-hmm. it's just our setup. <laughs> um, so mm-hmm. uh, what I want to do first is calculate um, the the numerator of 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 base of the base calculation. So it's a likelihood times a prior, right? So f of y given p is the likelihood, mm-hmm. f of p is the prior. So what you see here, um, the first thing uh, uh, in front of the time, the multiplication symbol, is simply uh, a, a binomial probability mass function. Um, we've all mm-hmm. seen that before. The second thing in brackets is the, um, the, the beta PDF, okay? And those gammas, the, those are simply, um, that's the generalization of the factorial. Right. So three factorial is six, but you don't know what three point five factorial is. Well, there's a gam. This gamma function does that for you. OK, mm-hmm. so I'm not constrained to having positive integers A and B. Um, so uh, so the first thing I did uh, was I combined those two things. All right. Uh, no, let's go back. Sorry. Go back. I, I have to talk more about slide twenty seven. Yeah, slide 27, okay. right? Yeah, we're on 28. I'm seeing 28, but I need 27. So the well, that's happening. I'm seeing 20. So there we go. Thanks. So the first yeah. thing I did was I realized uh, the kernel of both of those distributions is p to the something times one minus p to the something else. So mathematically, I can combine those exponents with addition, and then I put all the gamma functions out front and. And they're all constants. I know every one of them because I decided on what A and B are, and N and Y are known from the data. Okay, 
So my job now is I want f of y to, for my denominator so I can get my posterior distribution. So my job is to integrate out p from the only th thing left over is the distribution of y, OK? And so what I have to do is integrate that big thing. Um, mm -hmm. And it, that looks hard, but it's not because all, I realized that if I had the right constants in front of p to the something, one minus p to the something else, that that would be a different beta distribution, okay? And it would integrate by, by, by mathematics. And so what I did is I put the right constants in front of it. I moved these constants, and then I put the inverse of those constants there. So now everything integrated to one, I just have a bunch of gamma functions. Um, now can we go to the next slide? So I cheated. I figured out a trick to do the integral. Well, a lot of integration is tricks anyways, if you've taken <laughs> like a second semester calculus course. Um, so now that allows me to complete Bayes' law. And that thing, that first line looks kind of ugly. But, you know, you pull out the red pen or whatever, and a bunch of those thing, those gamma uh, functions uh, cancel each other out, and you get the mm -hmm. second line. And that's just that's just the, the the that's the posterior for b given y. That's just another beta distribution, and it's different from the other beta distributions you saw. But it's a beta distribution with y plus a and minus y plus b as the two parameters. Okay, um, the there's an important principle here, which is posteriors are always compromises between data information, and you can see that in p uh, given y. Um, and um, that's uh, I picked this example because it's very, very clear, but that's not all. There's actually more. Can we hit the down button? Um, uh, so this is I, I'm going to look at something P bar. OK, that is I'm going to look at the posterior mean of this uh, parameter P. It turns out that the mean mm -hmm. of a beta distribution is the first parameter over the sum of the parameters, right? So you see it's y plus a over y plus a plus n minus y plus b, okay? okay. I'm just gonna algebraically rewrite that into the form you see on the right-hand side, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, this is really, this reveals something interesting. So normally I make this a Q and A thing, but based on time and distance. Um, so the, so the, the first, the first term, y over n, is the data mean. How many heads out of how many flips, right? Uh, and it's it's weighted by something, okay? Um, and the second thing is the prior mean. It's the first parameter over the sum of the parameters. So the posterior mean is a weighted sum of the data mean and the prior mean, okay? And it turns out this principle uh, true for every Bayesian model, even really complicated, okay? It's just very simple here. But that's not all. It's even more elegant than, than I've said so far. Let's think about what happens when n gets really, really big as n goes towards infinity, okay? In the second term, I usually make this Q&A too, right? There's only an n in the denominator. So that mm -hmm. second term goes to zero, right? You see that? Mm -hmm. In the first term, there's an n in the numerator and an n in the denominator. So for any non-pathological a and b, right, that bracketed thing goes to one. Mm -hmm. So in the mm -hmm. limit, the posterior mean goes to the data mean. And to speak more colloquially about that, the data in Bayesian models always wins in the limit. If you've got gigantic, gigantic data, you you doesn't matter what your priors are. So for the SETI project, if they were doing statistical modeling, they would never, they could do Bayesian modeling, but they would never have to worry about what the prior should be. It would overwhelm it um, uh, completely, okay? Um, so, so that's a neat thing, meaning if I have loads and loads of data, I don't care so much what the literature has said or what I thought this thing should be, you know, when I was reading various things or, um, but on the other hand, in the case of like Italian marriage rates, right, when I've got 15 data points, the prior matters a lot. In fact, the prior it is it's what's going to help me get a good result, okay? Mm -hmm. It means mm -hmm. also that I have to mm -hmm. highly justify that prior and I have to write it up so that people believe it. Um, so let's do a data example of this. 
can we go on to the okay. next? Um, so, um, so here's a data set from Romney, and not the one you're thinking of. This, <laughs> Romney, this yeah. Romney is a cultural anthropologist, um, and one of the things he studies is is a thing called cultural consensus, and that's it's that's a sort of theoretical idea about how much do societies agree on stuff. So it turns out um, that advanced industrialized society agree on less stuff than primitive societies. Uh, that you know information flow and competitive ideas and whatnot, uh, complex industrial phenomena make people disagree on more more stuff. Um, that's uh, anyways. So um, Romney's testing it here with these 18 data points. I think it's 18. Um, and what he did is he he went to um, rural Guatemala and he interviewed peasant women and asked them, do they think polio is contagious? OK, it is, by the way. And you see here, there's not perfect cultural consensus either way. Like if they were all ones or all zeros, there would be perfect cultural consensus. But there isn't. So let's think about estimating um, the 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 P here. This is the same. I don't have to do the, the I already gave you the closed form of the posterior. So I'm going to do two priors. I'm going to do a beta 15 2 prior and a beta 1 1 prior. OK, so the beta 1 1 prior is a flat prior. <clears throat> so one of the special cases of the beta distribution is a uniform distribution between 0 and 1. The beta 15 2 prior, that's my prior reading Romney's work. OK, so I read all of his work on the topic and I thought he's not a statistician. Um, and I thought about what he was telling us, and I looked at some of his basic models where he just estimated proportions and things like that. And I feel that that's a good reflection of what he was telling us about rural uh, agrarian societies in, in this context. Now, if I, this is a pedagogical example. If I were to have to write that up for a, an article, I would, I would have to spend a reasonable amount of time, like at least a half a page on how I got that prior. So I already have the recipe for the posteriors from the last page. So the results are a beta 32.9 and a beta 8. Um, if we could have the next uh, slide, um, you, you can't really tell what that means without seeing the graph. So um, the first one, uh, the top the top graph, that's um, using my Romney prior. Um, and you can see what that that prior looks like in gray. And the the posterior is the is the black, the 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 darker. Uh, distribution. Uh, I didn't have to put the scale on this because it's always between zero and one. It, it's it's a beta distribution posterior. Now below you see the flat prior and the posterior resulting from the flat prior. And so I learned two several things doing this. One is the um, the prior is not super influential here. That means the data have a lot to say. I'm not saying they're not different, but they're not wildly different. The priors are very, very different, and almost as different as I could make them in some ways, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so even though the priors are very different, the data have a lot to say. So, um, so they're not moving the posterior dramatically differently. Um, mm -hmm. However, they are different. Um, the flat prior moves the posterior sort of towards the middle. 0.5 would be perfect non-consensus, right? Half say yes, half say no. Um, so, so the vagueness in the prior moves that that posterior a little bit, bit more towards 0.5. Okay. The other mm -hmm. thing that you'll see or seeing is that um, the flat prior means that the posterior is a little more it adds more uncertainty into the Bayesian calculation, whereas the Romney mm -hmm. prior had had quite a bit of certainty to it, right? And so it's not as spread out, and and that makes sense, right? The flat prior is not a no information prior, but it's a very low information prior. It doesn't add a lot of information. OK, down below you see um, what's called a highest posterior density interval. OK, it's 95 just because I wanted to do that. Um, that's the Bayesian version of a confidence interval. OK, and so if if you answered A in our little quiz, this will make you happy. That is what you want. That's what every undergrad before you beat it out of them wants the confidence interval. There's a 0.95 probability that the true effect is in that range given the data and the model. Isn't that what you would want a confidence interval to be if you could make it that way? So I didn't mm -hmm. put the numbers, but you see that um, 
the 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 HPD interval is a little wider uh, for the flat prior than for the informed prior, and that's natural too. So this is probably the most revealing Bayesian theoretical idea. I, I think mm. I'm just going to rush through a. Um, um, we did start a little late, so maybe I have a few credits um, uh, in my bank. Um, <laughs> uh, maybe a more nuanced social science example. Can we go to the next slide? Um, so this graph is slightly out of date, uh, um, but uh, so uh, uh, when I when I give this um, example in Europe, it reminds my audience that uh, yes, we're barbarians and we have a death penalty, and it's it's <laughs> predominantly done by um, by states. And so at the time of this analysis and this map, fifteen states did not have a death penalty on the books, and thirty five did. Uh, I think it's down to um, uh, uh, you know something like um, uh, it's, well, it's, it's different now. It's more progressive. Uh, for instance, I know mm -hmm. Colorado no longer does. Anyways, so um, so if you're going to do an analysis of the death penalty by state where it's practiced, and you're going to then use that to say something about the United States, um, and and you don't um, include those 50 states, your results are obviously going to be biased because you don't know how many executions um, the New York state would do if it still did, right? So can I have the next slide? So the classic classic way to deal with that is what was what's called a Tobit model. Um, as you see, it's um, from 1958, okay? It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a very important classic model to have in your social science toolkit to be aware of. And it's not hard to understand. There's variations on it. I'm going to do a very simple version today. If you know the Econometrics book by Amemia, there's a whole chapter on it, and it's it's a wonderful chapter. I recommend reading it. Um, so, um, uh, so I want to know um, what what social reasons um, it, uh, cause more more or less executions to happen in a given year by state. And so, what the Tobit model is going to let me do is account for those 15 states where I don't see the outcome variable. So it could be that people in New York State would have a preference that could be expressed by politicians. A, a classic theory in this literature is if more people want more executions, politicians realize that and do it, okay? Uh, and there's reasonably strong evidence for that. So can we go on to the next slide? So the Tobit model deals with this by specifying a, a, a latent dimension and modeling on that latent dimension. So if I knew everything, right, I would just do something like X beta and I'd be done, right? Um, so I'm gonna pretend I know everything for a moment. And I, X beta plus the error term, obviously, defines the latent dimension, which I'm calling Z, standard for these models, notation-wise, okay? So the latent dimension knows everything. So it, uh, that way, I can just do a straight, normal, linear model, as you see here. Um, and the way I, I connect that latent dimension to the observed dimension, the Ys, the counts that I'm seeing, is through the following setup. Y sub I is equal to Z sub I if Z sub I is greater, okay? Y sub I is equal to zero if Z sub I is less than or equal to zero. So what I'm doing is I'm using the negative part of the latent dimension Z to model what would have happened, okay, with these, if, if, if the data were available. Um, so that means that the normal likelihood function has two pieces. Um, the second piece is the one you're used to seeing. Um, I'm moving my cursor around, but that's illogical, uh, except that Y sub I is stipulated in the product to be greater than zero, not I equals one to N, okay, which is the way you're normally seeing it. So that's the regular one you're seeing that for the observed uh, y's. On the other side, y sub, when y sub i is zero, a different product gets gets, gets added. No, I'm sure that's bad language. A different quantity gets producted mm -hmm. into the likelihood function, which is one minus the normal CDF of x beta over sigma. Okay? So I'm flipping around a normal distribution to the negative side, okay? A, a, a normalish thing to the negative side. I, I, that, that's a little arm waving, which I'm literally doing at the moment, but that's the general idea behind a Tobit model. So can we mm -hmm. go to the next slide? OK, 
Okay, so it's it's a Bayesian model. So um, I want to do uh, I want to stipulate priors, and I'm going to stipulate um, the simplest priors I can come up with. Okay, so normal priors for um, the regression parameters, and an inverse gamma prior for sigma squared. So the simplest priors are what are called conjugate priors, usually the simplest mathematically. So conjugacy means that the that the form of the prior flows down and gives you the same form of the posterior. And we've already seen one of those in the in the Romney setup. Uh, I had a beta prior and I had a beta posterior. OK, um, and there's about 10 or 12 of these setups and they were wildly convenient for Bayesians before MCMC because you could get an answer readily. So if you have a, a, a for instance, a Poisson likelihood function uh, and a gamma prior, you get a gamma posterior. And you know, like I said, there's a, roughly a dozen or maybe less of those. Um, in, the, in the setup here, um, it, it's actually semi, it's called semi-conjugate. Um, so if you have an inverted gamma on sigma squared, you'll get an inverted gamma uh, for, the pos for the posterior. In the case of the beta vector, it's conditional on, it, it has to be mathematically conditional on sigma squared. So it'll still flow down and be a normal, but it had to be conditioned on something else, okay? Um, and that's not really a, 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 an inconvenience or anything. It's just a mathematical fact. Um, so, uh, uh, so the way I'm going to I'm going to model this. Can we go to the next slide or estimate this? Excuse me. Oh, okay. So, okay. So I forgot. To, no, go back. Okay. So, so, so you saw how simple the calculation of the posterior was in that in that um, beta binomial setup for the Romney example. Here I'm doing the same thing mathematically. I'm multiplying the likelihood function that you saw times all the priors that I care about, okay? And what you see in front of you, right, is this big, ugly, awkward thing, right? Um, and so my job now is to pull out the yellow pad and the mechanical pencil and integrate out everything but beta naught and then integrate out everything but beta one, everything but beta two. I think I've, I'm up to beta six or seven in this example, and then integrate out everything but sigma squared. And then I have a regression table. So this is the exact problem that Bayesians had that MCMC solves, okay? That is, it's not that hard to specify a realistic social science where it's either very hard or impossible to do those integrations, okay? Um, and and so I, I give this example partly to give you a sense of what your job would have been in 1989, right? You, you'd probably still be doing it in 1990, working on it, right? Um, and so um, <laughs> so instead, uh, I'm going to set this up with Gibbs sampling, which is uh, one of the two major variants of MCMC. Can we go to the next slide? So it turns out that a much easier job is to take that big joint marginal and turn it into a series of conditional distributions. In the MCMC world, these are called full conditional distributions, okay? Um, so, so I was able to uh, uh, mathematically create those full or derive those full distributions. So there's the full distribution for the betas. There's the full distribution for sigma squared. There's the full distribution for the Zs, Z i equals one through n, okay? Um, uh, with the truncation involved because of the, um, the um, uh, I, I have to do this for the, the, the negative part, as you see there, with that indicator function. Um, so uh, here's how Gibbs sampling works. And um, this is a little bit of an arm waving one, but it's fairly intuitive. I'm gonna have starting points for all these unknown parameters, okay? I'm gonna draw beta from this, from this normal distribution. I'm just gonna draw that vector, or I can do them one at a time if I like. Um, and then I'm going to take those betas, I'm going to plug them into the conditional for sigma squared, right? You see those in the numerator. Then I'm going to draw an inverted gamma distribution with those parameters and assign it to sigma squared. Then I'm going to take those updates, I'm going to stick them into the, to the full conditional distribution for the z's, I'm going to draw those. I just did one step of a Gibbs sampler, okay? Um, the key is that I always use the most updated version of the other parameters. I just told you how to do that once, but in fact, I'm going to do that 10,000 times or 50,000 times or a million times, okay? 
um, th this is um, this is this process defines a Markov chain, and there's a proof that if you meet some uh, a host of mathematical conditions, that these values will eventually converge to what's called a stationary distribution, and the values in that stationary distribution can be treated as if they're IID draws. And then all you have to do is summarize them with, with mean or, or var in R, and you get your regression table. Um, that's a bit of an arm-waving version of it, but the key is you let the computer run for a long time under the right circumstances, and eventually, uh, it's called the ergodic theorem, uh, you get a, a set of draws that are from the marginal distribution, can be treated as they're from the marginal distributions. That's basically magic, except that it's mathematically proven, okay? Um, the Gibbs sampler is proven to be an ergodic Markov chain, um, so we know it will eventually, if the model is identified, uh, reach it, the, the stationary or ergodic distribution, and then all, all, our work is take 10,000 values and put them in uh, in R and say, I want the mean of this. I want the standard deviation of this. I want the quantiles of this. And once you finish like running the chain, life is so simple. And if I have 10,000, 50,000 draws from beta one for my model, I don't need to know what the analytical version of it is. I know everything about it that I care. And I can graph it. I can build a regression table for beta one or include it, whatever. So let's go to the next slide for the results. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, there is an actual, actual Gibbs sample um, for this. Uh, I forget which parameter, but I purposely, st there's the first 100 um, steps, and there's the last 100 steps for two of the parameters. And and um, let's see, 500,000 times, which is way overkill. Um, and, and I deliberately started these two parameters away from where I thought the posterior mean was going to be. And you see the Gibbs sampler you know, start, starts moving uh, pretty quickly in that direction. And the last 100 values, you can see, once it's in a stationary distribution, it just hangs out. It's not going to go back to where I started it, or, or well, in the limit, but not very often. Um, so it's, it's running around in the stationary distribution very happily. And, you know, I can take the last 50,000 draws or whatever, and there's my regression table, which is on the next slide if we could go to that. Um, so now I have a regression table. It, it was trivial. And you can see, I can, I'm not really in this literature, but I can say, you know, pass rates are really important, uh, opinions important, ideologies surprisingly unimportant, whatever. Um, so, uh, so now I'm done. I'm writing up the article, life is easy. Um, so that's the problem the MCMC solved for the Bayesians. Can we go one more slide? Mm -hmm. Um, Very nice. Yeah. So we can either do a sports example or do question and answer. It, it, you know, we're getting probably question and answer is better. Um, yeah. OK, yeah, let's let, let's go for some uh, Q&A time. Maybe we can uh, you can use uh, some some of your more slides. Actually, you have 70 something slides to illustrate uh, the questions, okay. uh, the, the answers. All right. So um, I think uh, we have Peter and I will uh, uh, take turns. Maybe I will see if uh, there is any questions from our side. I'll, I will start some questions first, then uh, that will pass on to Peter's side. And is any questions um, uh, related to Bayesian and related to data science and, and because uh, Dr. Gil can actually can answer any questions on data science too on um, yeah. particular machine so, learning. <laughs> yeah, I can also yeah. I talk about political analysis for people who are interested in submitting. Um, why don't we take the slides down because they're slow enough that you know, they might not be useful. And, um, okay. and then um, I, maybe I can see people or whatever as well. I can certainly see Carl and, and, and Peter, so that's important. Now I can do it like a community uh, and stop, stop spotlighting. Then I can see everyone more like, OK. And now it's on the screen. I think I will start with some questions. I think uh, 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 
so I, I, I brought up some questions about machine learning and also the um, the, the Stanford uh, group of uh, uh, statistical learning, Tipsarani, Hasty, and Leo Brainman, and uh, those talking about uh, uh, predictive or uh, prediction over uh, 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 what are called the data model uh, versus the algorithmic model. So a lot of them are actually coming from the Bayesian tradition, but uh, mm -hmm. um, they do not acknowledge that, that oh, it's the Bayesian. A lot of them from, come from the Bayesian too, particularly uh, when you do the uh, bootstrapping, uh, resampling, and do the lasso, ROC, and a lot of them are coming from the, the, the Bayesian thoughts or uh, uh, thinking of a model. Now, um, I, I think uh, uh, in the school of machine learning, and uh, I, I, I think I'm still seeing that uh, uh, they are not fully implementing the Bayesian uh, uh, modeling methods, uh, such as using MCMC, Gibbs sampling, they are, are still are very happy about using uh, a bootstrap and uh, resample and mm -hmm. get some uh, ROC and then uh, shrinkage, uh, try to identify the, and then come up to the best accuracy. Oh, I, yeah. I can predict the model 87.87%, uh, um, 87 then that is good. So uh, uh, I believe that they, 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 they have yet to think about Bring in uh, the prior, bring in the Bayesian in the picture yet? Would you would you see that this will be uh, uh, much more to 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 uh, advance? I would I would say put it that way. Maybe some more to be advanced. I think. Uh, can you comment on that? Yeah, um, a couple observations. It, you know, the core of machine learning is classification. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I want some continuous well. in, in bins. Okay, um, and, and yeah. in different ways, you, you know, random forests and 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 support vector machines. Yeah. It's all about models. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's about classifying data into categories. Not all, mm -hmm. but it's a, a huge proportion of it. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so the big one big thing, big. and you, you, there, you can find papers about that. And, oh, 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 sorry. And the second tenet of machine learning is prediction is more important than estimation. Mm -hmm. OK, that yeah. is um, I, I want to say something uh, uh, about um, I want to these predictions, these binnings, and I'm less concerned about whether beta seven in the regression model is significant or something of that nature. Right. Because, <laughs> yeah. the you know, what I'm saying mm -hmm. and if, if the predictions yeah. are good, and that's my yeah. objective. I literally don't care very much about a regression table underlying the predictions or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. I, I'm saying regression table very, very broadly. Um, mm -hmm. Because it, it, suppose, you know, the things that fed into my classification, I had I had 10 uh, covariates, 10 coefficients, and seven of those were not statistically reliable, but the prediction was terrific it, by including them. Then, mm -hmm. then I would still include them, right? The, the, mm -hmm. the sort of the sense mm -hmm. of uncomfortableness between that those objectives and being fully Bayesian is that a fully Bayesian process of that would would want to have a distribution around those those binnings, those class, you know, mm -hmm. those classifications. Yeah. yeah. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I've done some work in this area and it's hard to be fully Bayesian like that. Um, mm -hmm. One mm -hmm. of the reasons is that um, uh, the number of clusters that you have for for data, uh, the number of possible clusters is huge. OK, mm -hmm. so if I had four data points, there's 15 clusters. There's a bunch, you know, there's one where everybody's in the same cluster. There's one where everybody's in different clusters. There's there's some two two combinations and three one combinations. And that adds to 15 clusters. So if I had only had four data points, then there's 15 possible classifications that I could do mathematically. OK, on the other hand, yeah. if I had 30 data points, OK, which is still a modest data set, there's one times 10 to the 24 
possible cluster configurations, possible classification. And to give you a sense of how big that is, and the reason I memorized that number is one times 10 to the 24th is an estimate of the number of stars in the universe. <laughs> <laughs> so, so in other words, if you if you downloaded a set and and this this thing um, this function goes up it's called a bell number and it goes up dramatically okay um, <laughs> if you had a hundred survey respondents which is still pretty modest right uh -huh. you're gonna have something like uh, a trillions uh, more no trillions of trillions and trillions of more clusters that is classifications you could have more than the number of stars and, um, and, and it goes up incredibly fast this bell number. Mm. So, mm -hmm. um, so, so one of the, the challenges in like doing predictive classification in a Bayesian way is figuring out how you want to model that or express that posterior uncertainty. And in my mind, that's the most difficult challenge of combining approaches and, and probably why there isn't as much of it as there should be. So um, I would hope that, you know, like it, it, in the future, if people could possibly do it, say I'm 80% accurate, okay, uh, in my prediction, right? And here's the credible interval or HBD around it, the Bayesian interval, okay? Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and um, there are ways to get that. But here's another related problem is, let's say you have a classification and then right next to it is a slightly different classification. Like mm -hmm. case number seven got moved from and in case number 12 got moved from this bin to another bin. That's almost mm -hmm. the same classification, right? So mm -hmm. in terms of cluster space, which is really, really hard to visualize, like you would want a posterior across cluster space. This is something I'm working on. Like, in other words, you have a posterior distribution. Um, this point it, uh, next to the mode is almost the same as the mode, right? But the mm -hmm. number of the number of classifications that are next to the classification that you predicted is huge in the way that I was just talking about with the bell number. Does that answer your question, Carl? I think that, yeah, this open up uh, um, our discussion, uh, most importantly about the the application and also the, uh, um, the efficacy of this uh, uh, Bayesian approach. And I thought, uh, I think one of the slides, uh, uh, Prompt me to think about um, the end here. That the data, and you suggested that the end goes to infinity. There's a lots and lots of data. In 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 that, this is really re uh, real. So real now. We have so much data nowadays in the big data world, and everything could be like a, a, a millions of cases. But uh, imagine that if you have a large end, but much of this end. Uh, much of these data are generated in a way that that could be uh, not e even uh, relevant to the measurement of that variable. So, yeah. so that could be leading to, of course, uh, a lot of uh, uh, computation power waste, but also uh, 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 not to help, not to be helpful about uh, coming up to accuracy. So Google has some problem already, and uh, uh, you heard about a Google flu trend. It's exactly the, this problem. They have large yeah. end. They that, that does not bump up to the the, the 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 confidence about hey, this is the right uh, uh, prediction because they have, they they pull in a lot of in, irrelevant data. Then that is a measurement issue. Then and then they make 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 them think like we have a large end and we have uh, more data. Then, then, then of course that uh, Google flu trend, uh, uh, they, they ended up uh, 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 missing the target by, by, by threefold, fourfold, and I think this did, did that made uh, Gary King and uh, and uh, his group uh, famous for re, uh, analyzing the problem of Google. Then, uh, uh, so they have the science article, and uh, so from the Bayesian perspective, uh, Professor Gill, what what do you think about this? Uh, uh, data being uh, generated in a way that 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 is that is not even uh, supposedly helping you with the uh, end. Yeah. The yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Listening to you make those important points, I'm reminded of a, a very famous phrase: "Geigo, garbage in, yeah. garbage." <laughs> 
right? Yes. <laughs> and yes. that's always been true, right? But if you think about it, in 40 years or less, uh, humankind mm. went from having not enough data to having too much data. Yes, indeed. Yeah. yeah. In, in fact, I have a JOP article about this coming out next month. Um, um, oh, congratulations again. Yeah, yeah. thanks. And, um, yeah. you know, so the problem of too much data is a totally different problem, of course. And yes, um, data quality to a person like me is sometimes out of my control in the sense that I, in, over my career, I have done it, but I generally don't collect my own original data. Um, so I'm at, I'm at the, the mercy of people that do it, and many people do it well. But I would say, you know, to someone who um, is new to this area, don't trust data naively, right? Even if it seems to be coming from a good source. You, you mm -hmm. can't, yeah, I mean, you really have to understand your data. You have to explore it in, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a language. Uh, you, you can mm -hmm. find suspicious things that lead to more investigation. Why is this mm -hmm. thing bimodal? It shouldn't be bimodal, you know? And, and um, you know, why is this segment of the data so different yeah, than the rest exactly. of the data? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. Um, you know, uh, these sort of things uh, are really, really important right now. And the, you know, the era where you would download a data set from ICPSR and just start running models is pretty much over, right? I'm not saying you don't <laughs> download it from ICPSR, but, yeah. you know, um, we get data from all kinds of sources. Uh, yes. And um, you, I think you just have to be more critical and more investigative. Um, so not mm -hmm. a couple of years ago, I, I got a huge data set um, from a, a, a political data consulting firm that's highly partisan in the United States, okay? Um, they did work for Trump's first campaign. And it's it's an amazing data set because it has demographics, it has uh, questionnaire information, and it has home addresses in the United States. Wow. <laughs> like literally the home address with permission of the respondee, okay? And um, I really wanted to use it. it. You know, it's a phenomenal data source uh, and my, I was concerned that it came from a highly partisan, you know, project, right? Um, you know, in uh, giving the Trump campaign information. Well, it turns out after I went through it for quite some time, I was able to get a sell in my co-authors that, you know, this is not partisan. It, there's no partisan bias in built into the data. And, you know, it's got millions of records. Um, so it took wow. a while. Yeah, millions of records with home addresses is just unbelievable. Um, so, uh, so I think it's a it's a big challenge, and you know, mm -hmm. people that are young in you know in empirical, statistical, social science should be aware of it every day because it will affect you if you're not careful. All right, I think I, I, I took up too much time. I I, I need to uh, uh, invite uh, the Taiwan side, uh, Peter. Sorry, and I, I took too much time. And uh, uh, oh, I, I can go to whenever. I'm fine. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Well. Uh, well, first of all, I want to say. Oh, now I can't hear you. Uh, here. Can I hear you? Somehow the mic is mute. Can you check on it? Mm. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah I can hear you oh, now. Okay, yeah. okay. Well, I just want to say thank you for this wonderful presentation, but uh, I have to admit that you know, part of it is quite, um, you know, just over our heads and <laughs> for some parts. And uh, uh, so our students here, uh, we, we have just very preliminary um, questions about the idea of uh, the Bayesian model. Uh, some of us are quite um, kind of troubled with the idea of a prior probability or um, the, the idea of a subjective probability, you know, which can be a belief issue in some way. So um, the, the question goes like, what, what distribution of probability to start with? Like, uh, you know, if we want to guess uh, or the, the, the prior belief of what a, a distribution could be, uh, is that a normal distribution to start with or you know in case that we don't have the prior uh, knowledge about the, the the distribution 
So normal distribution yeah. would be uh, the first choice, and and then you know proper and then the proper specification of a conditional probability becomes another issue too. So uh, what's the general um, suggestion or recommendations for um, our uh, novel students or novel uh, Bayesians? Yeah, thank you. Sure. Um, so in the social sciences in regression modeling for regression coefficients, you're absolutely right, Peter, that the default is a normal. Um, and the de default is a normal centered at zero with large variance. And that's considered a diffuse, uh, low information prior. I, I really like regression priors th that center at zero because it means that the data have to move it off zero. So let's say, you know, beta seven was mean, mean seven variance one in posterior terms. And you started mm -hmm. with a, mean, a, a, a prior mean of zero. It means the data moved moved that that uh, that statistic from zero to seven. The prior didn't do that, and that feels to, those events feel to me like I'm doing the right thing. I'm I'm you know I'm I'm getting a lot of evidence that that, that thing lives around seven. So that's a very common thing in the social sciences. It's probably ninety percent of what people do. Um, you can get diffuse priors for variance terms like inverted gammas that with long tails the reviewers almost never argue with that um, and so that's pretty straightforward it's it's built into um, some packages where you don't have to do MCMC mm -hmm. so the ARM package in R has has a has a um, uh, it, it's Bayes GLM I think is the, the name of it um, uh, MCMC pack is another R package that makes things very easy for you. Um, these are non-hierarchical but standard regression models, and you can stipulate it that way. It's only slightly harder in both cases than doing GLM in R. Uh, mm -hmm. when, you, when you get weird, unique features, you end up going to MCMC typically. Um, I don't know of a closed-form Bayesian Tobit, for example, um, but the last time I looked mm -hmm. was a few years ago. So priors, um, they, they're they less controversial than they used to be. And generally what you want, want to do is you want to put the prior you want on something and then compare it to other priors. Maybe a flat prior, maybe a normal that's you know spread out wide and just see what the posterior differences are. And if the mm -hmm. posterior differences are big, then you need to recognize that your prior, the one you stipulated is influential. I'm not saying it's wrong, but you have to say the prior mattered here. It, it, it made a difference. And here's why. Here's why I want to keep it. Right. Um, so years ago, I wrote a paper um, where in in education policy, there's two groups of people that argue with each other for years. Um, the economists say no matter how much money you throw at public schools in the United States, they're still going to be on average not so good. And some political scientists argue with them, Ken Meyer in particular, saying, no, it, it, management of the school really matters, the you know, other factors of the school matter. You can make certain schools better by by giving them more resources. And so I got a I got a convenient data set, and I had Meyer priors and I had Hanashek priors. Hanashek is an economist at Rochester. And um, so mm -hmm. same data, priors that I thought reflected those scholarly groups and i ran it on the same data and i got uh, obviously different results well it turns out the meyer pr priors uh, had a lot more um i don't know they were much more uh compatible with the literature they had much more logical consequences and so that was an article that deliberately modified priors in that way mm -hmm. okay thank you mm -hmm. all right carl yeah, there actually there are more applications. Uh, uh, like the education example, we can do a lot more ap uh, applications in in public policy research. Uh, whether it's such a policy uh, or uh, uh, versus the old policy, or maybe policy in different countries, you can see uh, uh, the influence of the the, uh, the prior. Now, uh, I think I, I wish I had more time to talk more about machine learning literature. Yeah. Uh, then I believe that 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 is the future of data science and to inc uh, to incorporate uh, the Bayesian approach 
and because now what we call the algorithmic model and a uh, uh, loss of the model are still not interpretable. Uh, inter interpretable means that, uh, oh, you, if we just don't mean in, in, in the algorithm, find the best algorithm to come up with the highest accuracy. Now I can predict this uh, X, X percentage, uh, uh, then X percent, uh, I'm correct. And, uh, so this is something that we still uh, uh, much to be expected if we, if we do not uh, know how to explain it. I think, I really believe that Bayesian uh, said so this come in uh, to improve this, to make it uh, uh, more sensible. And instead of just say that use a black box model, uh, model, yeah, something like that. Yeah. I think you, you you hold the key to the, <laughs> the future of data science, in my opinion, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah I mean, I, right. I, I think data science is generally applied to large data sets in, in, mm -hmm. in industry in particular. The priors uh -huh. don't matter, but being able to discuss the re results, the predictions probabilistically yes. could be huge. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. But much of the data science training uh, uh, basically ignore uh, the probability uh, uh, explanation. So they just look at, oh, I'll come up with the good algorithm and dump me into the uh, uh, random forest and model or uh, SVM now we which one is the best and we take the uh, random forest RF and uh, they come up with that this uh, 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 prediction and that is seems much to be much to be expected uh, from the Bayesian perspective of course and uh, I go back to the Bay, uh, Leo Bay Brayman article about the two cultures and uh, uh, the idea is still uh, to to bridge the two cultures and now yeah. we have one more culture we want we want to consider, which is the Bayesian too. Yeah. 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 Here's how bad that is. I agree with your observation. Yes. I co-direct a master's in data science program here at American University. Uh -huh. And mm -hmm. my Bayesian course is only an elective. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, <laughs> I think it should be becoming core. Yeah. In my opinion. <laughs> in my yeah. opinion. Yeah. I think it should be yeah. core. Yeah. I, I right. think so too. You know. <laughs> Progress is slow and sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hello, Peter. I have more questions from the students, a little bit uh, uh, overrun, but uh, I think. Uh, uh, yeah, a little bit, yes. <laughs> it's really a, a very great opportunity for us to have uh, Jeff uh, to address to both of both group of students and the UTD students here are uh, quiet and uh, maybe. Uh, we have a, a few students, and uh, I, I hope that in future we can uh, bring Jeff again and uh, on board, and so we can uh, talk more about the applications of Bayesian. And actually, in his in later slides, we saw I saw a lot of cases in your in your slides. And you have seventy something pages, and uh, yes, we are we're basically entering the door. <laughs> it's not seeing the room yet. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. The really, uh, you know, I would like to do yeah, that. Yeah. And, um, if anybody, students or anybody, has a question from this, I'm I'm Jay Gill at American.edu. Okay. All right. Or find yeah, me at JeffGill.org too. Sure. Yeah. We're gonna send questions if there's any. And actually, um, like Carl says that we we're hoping to see more application to to that because um, I think that's really what uh, interests the students first here. And I have to admit that, like I said, yeah, some of them are not, um, you know, um, uh, statistics savvy in, in some way. So uh, there, there's, there's a barrier as a threshold over there, but using the application and then try to, uh, you know, arouse their interest. I think that would be some, uh, and maybe next time we can try, uh, we can start from there, you know, start yeah. from application and then go back to uh, what mm -hmm. uh, statistic models or Bayesian models that we can use to solve this issue or analyze this issue? I think that that's probably what we can do. Now. I agree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but I would like to add also that, um, yeah. you know, in a very uncertain, chaotic world, economy, et cetera, data scientists still get jobs every time. Right, mm. big degree. There, there's no such thing as an unemployed degree data scientist, and by that means, 
that you could have some other you you could study sociology but with a focus on data science and statistics and you'll get a job um and so i i think i can't think of very many other industries like that nursing is one <laughs> right there's a shortage mm -hmm. of nurse nurses worldwide there's, there's always a shortage of data scientists in every economy mm -hmm. um, i'm working with a group in West Africa, actually, where we're, we're, we're doing a collaborative venture uh, starting in Ghana, but branching out from, from there. And um, there's huge demand for data science in West Africa, there's, you know, in virtually every part of the world. Um, so if you can do what you love in terms of content and then add the things you were talking about, Peter, um, applications theory, uh, then you're going to do well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Um, thank yeah. you a lot. And uh, Carl, is there any more questions over in on your side? All right. Um, I think this concludes our uh, 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 2020 uh, uh, data analytic colloquium events, and we are so so glad that we have a really a uh, 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 perfect finale and uh, to to uh, wrap up this uh, this term, but we we it's only the uh, uh, um, the prelude for the more 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 events to come. Uh, we 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 hope that uh, next semester uh, or next year we will have uh, another series of uh, uh, great speakers. And uh, actually, early on, I started to think of Jeff uh, to to come aboard and uh, somehow we have some miscommunications and uh, and uh, but anyways we want Jeff Jeff or other speakers to come back and then we more to come please stay tuned and uh, check our website da colloquium c a uh, d a uh, c o l l o q u i u m dot com and also uh, please please subscribe to our YouTube channel <laughs> nowadays oh. and uh, everything is uh, uh, could be posted, could be commented, could be uh, shared on our YouTube channel. Uh, YouTube channel so it's free, and we look forward to more events and more, uh, uh, particularly on data science. And uh, now, and uh, hopefully we will uh, invite uh, 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 Professor Gill on board again and uh, give us more illustration of the uh, Bayesian, yeah, Bayesian approach. All right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank I'm you. Gonna sign uh, off. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Thank you, thank you again, uh, Jeff. Have a good night and have a great uh, uh, winter break too. Yeah, everybody too. And good riddance to 2020. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Have a have a very pleasant, uh, you know, year year end of um, um the the season. Right. The happiest yeah. season's coming, right? Uh, I'm hoping. Yeah. <laughs> I'm hoping. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you. Bye. All right. All right. Bye. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. All right, then uh, I'll stop recording.